So this meeting is being recorded. Yeah. Hi. Okay. All right. You can see my screen. Let's get into slideshow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is our eighth class. Yes, eighth and final breastfeeding class, Breastfeeding 101G, Prenatal Breastfeeding Education. I have no conflicts or disclosures to give. Tamika Jackson Dyer, I'm an IBCLC, CHWCLE, CLS, bunch of letters. Um, <laughs> I am the breastfeeding subject matter expert for EMU CDC Reach and the Wayne County Healthy Communities NACHO project. Um, Okay, what was the last part you heard? Because I got kicked off. <laughs> um, right at the introduction after you read off the EMU reach line. Okay, so let's go back to sharing. Um, boop. Okay, so are you saying, wait a minute, is it sharing? No, sharing there we go. There we go. Okay, so you didn't hear any of the objectives? No. All right. Okay. All right, so the objectives for today are to dispel the myths regarding breastfeeding, to discuss, discuss the importance of exclusive breastfeeding, mommy milk only, uh, educate on the risks of formula feeding, get breastfeeding off to a good start in the hospital or after birth, learn how pacifiers can hurt breastfeeding, discuss breastfeeding during COVID-19, and why formula should not be introduced unless medically necessary. And we are going to really discuss what medically necessary means. So protect breastfeeding. That's what we're talking about today. Um, don't let the booby traps block you from your goals. For a great start, just breastfeed. Babies don't need anything but mommy milk. Um, you know, normally they, I would say a healthy full-term baby doesn't need anything but, um, but for the most part, even early babies don't need anything but mommy milk um, because two of the biggest, uh, I don't like the word benefits, but two of the um, biggest things that help out mommies and babies when breastfeeding are cutting the risk of SIDS by over 50% and reducing the risk of breast cancer in double digit numbers. Um, and so the more breast milk a mother makes, the more breast milk a baby takes in, the greater those benefits are for both. So I want to talk about the fact that, you know, a lot of times people uh, look at breastfeeding as a lifestyle choice, or I just don't think that's right for me, or I don't know how I'm supposed to do that. While breastfeeding may seem, may not seem the right choice for every parent, it is the best choice for every baby. Um, and so we're not just talking about mom's ability to breastfeed or desire to breastfeed, but also baby's right to receive mommy's milk um, because babies are born to breastfeed. So 
the first step to protecting breastfeeding is to learn your baby. Watch for their cues. Um, they will let you know when they are hungry. They can't talk yet, but they do communicate. Um, this is actually a baby who is very angry and has gone through the list of things telling his mommy that he is hungry and she missed the cues. Um, so when they start to get wiggly, smacking their lips, sticking their fingers in their mouth, um, turning their head from side to side, um, turning towards who whoever is holding, whoever, if they feel warmth and flesh, they're going to go looking for the breast. Um, and that's where they get both food and comfort. Breast milk is not just about, or breastfeeding is not just about food. It's also about comfort, security, closeness. Um, it helps to build baby's sense of self and community and lets them know that there is someone who is there who is always ready to meet their needs. Um, so that's why you breastfeed on cue, not on a schedule or when you think baby should be ready to eat again, because every time you respond to their um, cues, you are letting them know that you are there to meet their needs and it helps to build their um, sense of security. You want to talk to your family and friends or have your champion talk to um, the visitors and let them know how pacifiers and bottles and formula make it harder for baby to breastfeed. Uh, when I worked in the hospital, one of the biggest challenges was um, when visitors would be there and it was time for me to do a consult and, you know, grandma's interjecting her thoughts and comments or auntie is saying, well, didn't they just eat 20 minutes ago? Or, you know, dad is like, well, when do I get my turn? Making sure um, that they understand that giving pacifiers or bottles or formula, um, anything that is not the breast makes it harder for babies to learn how to breastfeed. Um, I know I said babies are born to breastfeed, but some learn how to do it better and faster than others. So even though uh, breastfeeding is natural and all babies are, are meant to do so, um, some of them take a little bit longer to get the hang of it. Um, and all babies need a little bit practice to get good at it. So making sure that you're only giving them the breast to make sure that they're learning uh, well is very important. Okay, and pacifiers. Mommy is the original pacifier. There is nothing like the real thing. Um, and the word pacify means to calm or to soothe. Um, why we got into letting some rubber plastic thing be what babies turn to for comfort and soothing is beyond me um, because that's what mommies are for. That's our job. Um, and so uh, one of the best examples that I love to give is that over in the UK, they actually call pacifiers dummies, which is short for dummy tit which means that it's basically a fake boob that you are giving to your baby to calm them down. Why do that when you have two of your own? So that's one thing to think about um, when people are like, oh, just you know, pop the pacifier in their mouth. No, you are what baby is looking for. Um, and making sure that they are at the breast, not just when they're hungry, but also when they need comfort and calming is very important. So how to calm a fussy baby, since normally what we do in our society is pop a binky in their mouth, hold your baby skin to skin where they feel warm and comforted. Um, and this works before or after feedings. And it's not just for newborns, babies, period, humans, period. We love hugs. We love to snuggle with our people, whoever we feel close to. So babies like that too, they are little humans. So they are programmed the same way. And being skin to skin helps to calm down their stress response. It brings down their cortisol levels, which is their stress hormone. It brings down your cortisol level because a crying baby is very stressful and raises those levels up in your body. Um, and it also increases your prolactin um, and oxytocin, which are the hormones that you need to make milk. So it works together, just holding and calming your baby. Um, one of the, uh, I actually saw a post on social media earlier this week um, well, not this week, it's Monday, but a few days ago um, that laid out the fact that as humans, we are mammals, we know this, we are mammals, we give birth to live young, we make milk, blah, 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 um, but we are carrying mammals, we are not nesting mammals, which means that our babies are meant to be in arms close to us or another caregiver pretty much all the time. Um, 
we do not um, make a nest and leave our babies to go out to forage or, or look for food or whatever, like some uh, mammals do, like uh, rabbits do that, um, deer do that. Uh, and so we are carrying mammals. We're like kangaroos or um, chimps or uh, koalas, any animal that you constantly see with their babies on them, we are part of that. Uh, mammalian class, which means that our babies are supposed to be close to us and near us and want to be close to us and near us all the time. So it doesn't mean they're being spoiled. Okay. It doesn't mean that they're, um, you know, being extra demanding. They are being human babies, mammals. They're doing what they're supposed to do. So what happens when you give pacifiers or bottles um, in the hospital? Well, it turns into a vicious cycle. So baby is hungry, right? Baby is hungry. You're trying to nurse or whatever. You calm them down. Uh, they get hungry. They, they act like they want to eat again shortly after what you feel like is too soon after. So you're like, oh, well, maybe I should just go ahead and give them this bottle so that they can be full because they're not getting enough of my milk. Um, and so they get the bottle and they get overly full because bottle feeding, um, Number one, in the first 48 hours of life, they really only need about five to seven milliliters, which is like a teaspoon to a teaspoon and a half of milk, which is exactly what you make. Um, those little bottles they give you in the hospital are about 55 to 60 milliliters. Way too much. Okay, so end up getting overstuffed, which can make them even more fussy because now their tummy hurts because it's too tight or they're spitting up all over the place. Um, and because formula is very hard for them to digest, it puts them into a very deep sleep because all of their body's energy has to go to breaking down. So because we expect them to eat three hour and a half or two hours, um, and they end up sleeping for three hours or being so full that they don't want to eat for three hours, your body has missed that ability to, um, that cue to give, make more milk. And because milk is move it to make it, the more you move, the more you make. Any missed feedings means a decrease in your supply. Um, and so then baby is like, oh, there's not enough milk coming out. It's not coming out fast enough. And then you give another bottle and it just turns into a big cycle. Um, what happens with pacifiers is babies need to suck. Their suckling need is met at the breast when you breastfeed. Um, so if you pop a pacifier in their mouth, when they start to give you signs and signals or be fussy, um, they will suck on the pacifier and it might even calm them down because sucking releases um, their calming hormones too. They're not sucking at the breast, which means they're not telling your body to make milk, which means you're not going to make enough milk. Um, plus sucking on a bottle or pacifier is very different than sucking at the breast. Um, I have not met a mother yet who is shaped like a bottle or a pacifier, and I've seen lots and lots of breasts over the last 10 years. Um, and so if a baby treats you like a bottle or a pacifier, it will hurt because the way that they suck on the bottle or pacifier is very different than the way they suck at the breast. So now you're having pain when you put baby to the breast and you're like, oh no, let me go ahead and let them have this bottle so I can you know, relax and, and heal. And again, the vicious cycle. So that's why we tell you not to introduce bottles or pacifiers until breastfeeding is well established, um, which is usually around the three week mark. So when is supplementation medically necessary? Okay, you see the little star next to supplementation. Um, often when we talk about supplement, people automatically think about a bottle of formula. Uh, a supplement is any feeding that is not directly from the breast, okay? It does not mean that it is an artificial milk substitute or anything like that. It means anything that baby gets that does not come directly from the breast. If it's not straight from the tap, it is supplementation, okay? So that doesn't mean you have to give a bottle if they say you need to supplement. Um, you can manually express uh, and give give baby, and we'll talk in a second about the different ways you can give it to them. You can pump so that baby can get your milk. Uh, you can ask for donor human milk from the hospital. There are many steps to take before baby gets formula. Um, and then medical necessity. Late-term preemies 
Um, a late term preemie is any baby, usually we call them like 36, 37 weekers. Full term is 40 weeks, 39 or 40 weeks. Um, 36 and 37 weekers can look like a full term baby. They can be full size, um, but they often act like a preemie. So their suck, swallow, breathe is very disorganized. Um, their latch and suckle can be kind of weak. Um, their signals are not as strong as full term babies. So you may miss some of their feeding cues um, and they tend to um, sleep a little bit more than a, a full term baby would. So you miss a lot of those cues and they, those babies can get into trouble pretty quickly um, because you know we have the myth of the good baby that sleeps a lot. And so uh, one of the worst things to hear if I call a client to check up on her and her 36 weeker is, oh, he's such a good baby. He sleeps for like four or five hours at a time. That is not a good thing because baby needs to be eating every hour and a half to two hours in order to maintain uh, healthy growth and a good milk supply. Um, if baby has low blood sugar, low blood sugar, um, there is no across the board agreement between like hospitals and doctors about what exactly is low blood sugar. Um, so the uh, standard that most IBCLCs follow um, is from the American Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine they have protocols. These are um, different uh, suggestions or guidance that they have laid out to uh, discuss different breastfeeding problems that come up uh, on a regular basis. And so according to the ABM, blood sugar below 46 in the first 48 hours of life is considered low. Okay. And that's really the only one we need to worry about right now because thanks to COVID, most people are being discharged at about 24 to 36 hours. So if baby's blood sugar drops below 46 during that time, it's considered low blood sugar. Um, after 48 hours, if it's below 40, um, I'm sorry, wait, I said it backwards. Let me fix it. Below 40 in the first 48 hours is low. Below 46 after 48 hours is considered low. So as long as baby's blood sugar is above 40 before discharge, which you know for normal vaginal birth right now is around 24 to 36 hours, as long as the blood sugar is above 40, there should not be any issues. Um, after two days, say if you had a C-section and you, you're in the hospital for over 48 hours, if the blood sugar is below 46, that's considered low. The important thing though is why would they be testing baby's blood sugar in the first place? That is not standard procedure uh, most of the time that they just go around poking babies to get their blood sugar. Uh, if mom has gestational diabetes, um, baby's blood sugar is going to be low and they are going to test it. Um, and supplementation would be considered medically necessary in that case. Uh, if baby is early, if they're a late pretermer, their blood sugars tend to be lower than they should be. So that may require medical, uh, medically necessary supplementation. Remember though, supplementation does not mean formula, okay? You can supplement with your own milk. Um, just had a case, actually my niece delivered um, out of state against my advice. <laughs> she left Michigan at about 38 weeks pregnant and decided she was going to have her baby in the new state. Um, and I get a frantic phone call from her mother because they're saying that the baby needs to be supplemented and his blood sugar is too low and all this stuff. Um, his blood sugar was not too low. It was actually within the normal range. Um, and there was no need to give him formula because she had adequate colostrum. Um, so knowing these things ahead of time can help you to avoid situations like they were ready to put him in the NICU. It was just a whole lot of stuff going on that was really unnecessary. Um, if the mom is unavailable, so if for any reason, um, you know, maternal in infant separation happens, um, if baby, uh, you know, sometimes when I worked in the hospital, if baby was going to be put up for adoption, different things like that, then obviously supplementation is medically necessary. Um, some of mom's medical conditions may make it um, difficult or impossible for her to make uh, enough milk for baby. So if she has um, 
if she doesn't have um, adequate breast growth, so she has some um, inadequate breast tissue. Um, if she is diabetic, it can take longer um, for her colostrum to switch over to mature milk and create enough for baby to have. Um, and then baby's medical conditions, if baby has a cleft lip or palate, it can make it um, difficult next to impossible to latch properly in order to get the milk out. Um, Down syndrome, um, extreme prematurity, things like that can make it uh, medically necessary to supplement. But you notice all of those things I listed um, are not that common. And so medically necessary supplementation is actually not that common. A lot of times doctors will order supplement um, or suggest supplement, um, but that doesn't make it medically necessary just because the doctor said it, okay? I wanna make sure that you understand what medically necessary means. Um, and also that supplementation does not mean formula, okay? So the three rules of breastfeeding support. As a lactation consultant, there are only three rules that I follow uh, when dealing with uh, a client or a baby. Um, number one is feed the baby. Number one, that is the most important thing. Make sure that the baby is eating. Number two, protect the milk supply. Make sure that mom is pumping or manually expressing uh, in order for her body to get those signals to keep making the milk. And then while we are feeding the baby and protecting the milk supply, we are looking for solutions. Um, so that's what you want to look for if you are getting breastfeeding support. Um, those three things, um, protect, feed the baby, protect the supply, find the solutions. Um, if you are not getting those three things, you need to find different support. So alternative feeding methods. Now we talked about why bottles are not great. Uh, um, and pacifiers. So what do you do? Because we got to feed the baby, right? So number one, you can cup feed. Um, you see this baby here is literally drinking from a cup. You can feed a newborn from a cup. Um, the standard cup that's usually used in hospitals is a Foley cup, but you can literally use anything. I have used a shot glass before. Any small, clean container uh, can be used to feed baby. Um, some drawbacks of this is that they're obviously not latching and suckling, um, but they are getting the food and, and they kind of, the way that they drink is like a kitten. They literally lap the milk up with their tongues. It's very interesting to see, um, but you can cup feed. Um, another way that works really well, especially when you're in the hospital, is spoon feeding. They always have, uh, you know, the plastic spoons and the wrappers around the hospital that you can use. You can literally manually express a little bit into that cup, like this baby here is getting this beautiful yellow liquid gold colostrum, and feed the baby with a spoon, and they will drink it off the spoon. Um, Finger feeding is another way. You can get a tube. It's like a little skinny tube. I think they call it like a Frenching tube um, and put it on your finger and it's attached to a container, usually a bottle or something. And baby will suck on your finger and get the milk that way. Um, this is an SNS, which is a supplemental nursing system. Remember, supplement does not mean formula. Um, a supplemental nursing system is something that is, uh, the tube part is filled with the food um, preferably mommy's milk or donor human milk, or if none of those things are available, formula. Um, and then this tube, instead of being taped to the finger, like with finger feeding, is actually taped onto the breast at the nipple um, so that baby is able to get food even if mom is not making enough milk. Um, and so this is important because with baby at the breast, those signals are being sent to mommy's body to make milk. They're able to practice suckling at the breast, which helps babies get better at it if they're having trouble. And they're still getting food, which means they're getting rewarded, which makes them keep suckling, which helps um, breastfeeding and the milk supply. Uh, and then finally, there are nipple shields. And I do consider uh, wearing a nipple shield as an alternative feeding method because baby is not latched directly to the breast. Um, a nipple shield is basically a little barrier, uh, usually made of silicone that is worn over the nipple. Um, and it's firmer, obviously, than a, a human nipple. Uh, this can be really helpful for babies who are having issues with um, 
uh, nipple preference, say like they, they were in the NICU and they were getting bottles. And so they've gotten used to that firm nipple feel of a nip, of a, a bottle nipple. And so this can help them transition to the breast easier. Um, or if mom has um, really large nipples, um, they can kind of compress them into a space that is easier for baby to latch on to. Um, if baby has tongue tie and it's causing mom a lot of pain because of the pinching that can happen with that until she gets it repaired um, or until they find a, a, a way to make it easier, um, this can protect her nipples and let baby get the milk. So protect breastfeeding. Starting off exclusively will help you reach your breastfeeding goals. Exclusivity is so important. Um, I know a lot of times we say, you know, it's not all or nothing, and it's not, um, and every ounce counts. That is true. However, we know that the best outcomes happen when babies receive only mother's milk. Um, when you supplement in the hospital or add in artificial uh, breast milk substitutes or bottle or you know bottles, pacifiers, any of those things. It rapidly reduces your chances of meeting whatever your breastfeeding goals are. Um, when babies leave the hospital that are not being exclusively breastfed, they are more likely to be weaned sooner than babies who leave the hospital exclusively breastfeeding. Um, when moms start supplementing in the hospital, they are less likely to continue breastfeeding as long as they had initially planned. Um, and it also introduces a foreign substance into baby's system. When babies are born, um, their stomach and their uh, digestive system is all brand new, open, clean, ready to go. Um, your colostrum is very thick, so it helps to coat the intestine and protect it from any pathogens or, or viruses or bacteria. That's really important in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and it gives them all of the nutrients they need. There is nothing man-made that can compare to the milk that you make for your baby. Oh, wow. And that's the end of that. I didn't realize oh, that was exactly OK. So now I'm seeing four. So there are two people online right now. Um, any questions, concerns, things that you want to know that I did not cover, please type it in the chat, or you can unmute yourself. Hi, Tamika. <laughs> well, yeah, because I have uh, problems about my blood sugar, uh, gestational diabetes during my pregnancy. Yeah, so when baby born, the, my, my third one that happens, like the blood sugar low. Yeah, so they, they just send my babies to the NICU. And so that, that time I really can't to breastfeed my baby. So the, they just introduced the formula for for my baby. So the next time the, my fourth one will come out soon. So I think I still have the same problem. Yeah, do you have any suggestion for me? Okay, so you had gestational diabetes with your first and they're saying you have it again now? Yeah. Okay, so um, they will test his blood sugar because mm -hmm. of that. And I'm gonna tell you why. So when you have gestational diabetes, what happens is um, your blood sugar is really, really high, okay? And so he's floating in the amniotic fluid, which is super sweet, you know, because of the, the sugar in your blood. So his pancreas, which is what normally would make the insulin and, and balance everything out, is basically in um, stasis. He, it doesn't have to do anything because he's getting all this sugar from your amniotic fluid. When he comes out and he is, cut off from that source of sugar from, from you, all of a sudden his blood sugar drops, like it plummets, it goes really low because his, his pancreas has not been doing anything. And so it's like, oh, wait, shoot, I gotta wake up and do some work, right? And so it can take a minute for his system to stabilize. So they're definitely going to test him and he will likely need supplementation. But remember, supplement does not mean formula. And putting him in the NICU actually makes the problem worse because being skin to skin with mommy helps to stabilize his blood sugar. 
So if he's taken away from you, that means he doesn't have access to being skin to skin with you, which will make his blood sugar go even lower. So being able to keep him with you skin to skin, um, offering your milk on a spoon, you know, off, you want him to latch, you want to, you want to try to get him to latch on, but then you want to go ahead and manually express like we talked about before, get that milk onto a spoon or into a cup so you can get him that blood sugar because nothing, nothing balances his blood sugar better than colostrum. Okay. They like to do formula because they can hurry up and just kind of pour it into a thing and give it to them. And no, nothing balances his blood sugar better than your milk. Um, so you, if you are leaking now, how far along are you? Where you do? Oh, uh, the, 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 the end of March. Okay. So yeah. as you get near the end, if you start to feel, feel really full or you start leaking, Mm -hmm. You can start to put some of your milk up now so that when you go into the hospital to have him in March, you already have some milk for him. You can um, freeze it because it's only, and don't pump. Okay, I want to be really clear. No pumping during pregnancy okay. um, because that can cause uh, premature contractions and premature delivery. But you can do manual expression if you, you know, if you're leaking or you're feeling yourself really full, you can go ahead and kind of squeeze some out. Um, you can get syringes usually from medical supply stores, not, not like the, you know, needles, but syringes that you can put liquid into, and you can have some of those in the freezer ready to go with you to the hospital so he can get the milk that way. Syringe feeding is one of the um, backup methods that you can use, um, and then that way he's only getting your milk, which will help to balance out his blood sugar faster, which will help him get to the breast easier, um, and you're not introducing something artificial into his system. So that's um, something that you can do proactively to make sure that you're getting his blood sugar up to levels. Um, and because now you know what the numbers mean, as long as he's above 40, it's not low, okay? So a lot of times, you know, they might be in the limbo. They'll be like right at like 41 um, and the doctors and the nurses are freaking out. As long as it's above 40, he is fine, okay? <laughs> so, okay. um, and if you're, are you planning to, uh, do you have a scheduled C-section? No. Yeah, it's a script nature. No? Okay. Yeah. Yes. If you can deliver now, that's also better because the C-section is very traumatic for you and for him, and that can cause his blood sugar to go down even more. Um, but keeping him with you, skin to skin, giving him anything that you may have saved up, or manually expressing to put it into a cup or a spoon. Um, really important and make sure that you ask for a lactation consult when you get there. You want that in your chart. So when you come to the hospital to have the baby and they're like, okay, do you plan to breastfeed? Yes. And I want to see a lactation consultant. So that is in the notes. So after baby comes, when the LC comes to the hospital and she's looking for who she needs to go see, it's already in the system. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's very good suggestion for me. Yeah, very helpful. So, uh, what, uh, how do you think is the uh, like uh, which weeks I can start to collect my, uh, the the milk? Like thirty seven or thirty six, I can start it. Um, I mean, some people start leaking at like twenty weeks. Um, it just depends on when you, but you don't want to artificially make it start coming. So usually. I mean, and some people don't don't ever leak, but you might start to feel like kind of some fullness or like you wake up and you have like a film on your nipple that was you leaking a little bit. Um, so you can manually express that out um, you know, as close to the end as possible. Um, but gestational babies tend to come a little bit earlier because they tend to be so big. Um, so usually like 34, 35 weeks, um, but no pumping, no pumping. <laughs> I want to make sure that that is clear. <laughs> No pumping during pregnancy. Thank you, Tamika. Anybody else? See, I see you're on here, Eliana. Any questions, concerns? All right, well, it looks like I have covered everything. Do you have anything for them, Rachel? Um, no, I'm just going to send the survey along with the recording. 
Okay, well, it's been fun on this adventure with you all. I hope I gave you information that you can use and that is helpful for you to get your breastfeeding journeys off to a good start. And we will see you later.